If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello Magic Community on YouTube, I'm T1 Glistener Elf. As you know, Modern Masters 3, Modern Masters 2017, is in its spoiler season right now. And while there are plenty of cards I could talk about individually, I'll leave that to other YouTubers who can perhaps better speak to them than I, but there's a topic that I've been wanting to speak about that's more meta, I suppose you'd say. Modern Masters 1, for those that remember, was a huge success, and success by the metric how many players joined Modern as a result, joined the main format. I don't think that that's really questionable, right? Modern Masters got a lot of people into Modern, and Mark Rosewater has gone on saying, you know, part of the reason that they supported Modern to the extent that they did is because they needed to prop it up a little bit. Once it got the ball rolling, it could hold itself, it could sustain itself. I'm paraphrasing, that's not his exact quote. Forgive me for not having that in front of me, please. But, and that makes a lot of sense. When you think of Modern Masters 1, it isn't just, it wasn't just, the mythics and the rares that sold the set. There were quite a number of commons and uncommons that were valuable. My favorite being Manamorphos, but also, for instance, the dredge creatures, Stinkweed Imp, Golgari Thug showed up. These were important because they granted accessibility to the format at a time when it just wasn't the case for a lot of cards. Think Tarmogoyf, for instance. Tarmogoyf was a paywall into the format for people that wanted to play several decks, really. This increased the number of Tarmogoyfs, making it where more people could get in. But you probably know where this is going. Where did Modern Masters 2 fall? It wasn't in its limited environment. I unfortunately never got the chance to play limited for Modern Masters 2, but I take the word of people around me, and some YouTubers, that it was a good limited environment. And I can see that. It looks like it to me. But in Constructed, outside of the rares and mythics, what commons or uncommons really stood out as being Constructed playable, Constructed popular? As far as I could remember, Lightning Bolt, Remand. That's about it. Modern Masters 2, obviously we don't want to compare it using the same metric, how many people joined the format, because a lot of people already had from the first set. Instead, let's look at how good it was at increasing accessibility. And it really wasn't. It's a limited print run, so the rares and mythics didn't increase the supply by too much, but the commons and uncommons really didn't either. And that's important, right? So Modern Masters 3 seems to my impression, based on what I've seen so far, and of course we don't have spoilers completely done right now as of the time I'm recording this, but then again that's sort of a good thing. That means there's potential for even more. Just for uncommons and commons, I'm thinking Path to Exile, Inquisition of Kozilek, Molten Rain, Might of Ulcrosa, Terminate. I'm pretty sure all of those are uncommons, but already, this early in, we're seeing more than two. <laughs> Lightning Bolt and Remand. That's a good thing. That means that we're getting increased accessibility. Now this isn't just good for players, this is also good for the company. The better the quality of cards you have, then the more packs you'll sell, right? But you can already see where this is going. Okay, well, why don't they just jam a bunch of great cards in there? Okay, the first answer is obvious. It's for limited sake. If you do nothing but good value cards, it's probably not going to be a good limited environment. But beyond that, I like to think of, I like to describe Magic's reprint policy in comparison or contrasting with Yu-Gi-Oh's reprint policy. Now, now stay, stay with me now, if you're not a big fan of Yu-Gi-Oh. Here's the starting point that I use. We understand that according to the Guinness Book of World Records, unless this has changed, Yu-Gi-Oh! is the game that has sold the most cards, has the most cards in circulation of any trading card game in the world. Okay, so that being the case, what are they doing right? And there, that doesn't necessarily mean it's strictly right, but let's start with that. Yu-Gi-Oh! has an extremely aggressive reprint policy. They used to have their own version of Chronicles. For those that aren't familiar, 
in Magic the Gathering, there was a set, essentially the first Modern Masters or Eternal Masters, it was a reprint set, called Chronicles. And what that did is it reprinted a bunch of older cards, like Blood Moon, for instance. Um, not thinking of any others off the top of my head, unfortunately, sorry. But it, it reprinted cards that, at the time, decreased their value by enough that collectors were mad. <laughs> and they thought that it was going to be, if they didn't do something about it, it was going to seriously hurt the game. Remember that investors, collectors, don't just buy off the secondary market. A lot of times they buy boxes and packs to invest in them. Either hold on to them, or open them, get good rares and mythics and whatnot out, and then sit on them and let their value go up, sell them later for a profit. That's one way that they make money, obviously. They make a lot of money off the players. But especially early in the game's history, people wanted to invest in something that they thought was on the rise. And if it looked like people were going to lose value on their cards every year, you don't want to invest anymore. And that cuts a lot into their, their revenue. So what do they do? They came up with the reserve list. We promise we're never printing these cards again. And they added to it. Eventually they stopped adding. You're not going to see any cards from Amon Ket show up on the reserve list. They aren't doing that anymore. But that's a promise that they're not going back on. And that's important. Yu-Gi-Oh, on the other hand, took exactly the opposite approach. I think it was called Dark Revelation. It was either Dark Beginnings or Dark Revelations. Forgive me, I'm not remembering which it was. I think Revelations. It was their first reprint set. And the same thing happened. Collectors were up in arms. Hey, you printed all these cars. They're losing value. Stop it. Why? Why are you doing this? Uh, but instead of coming up with a reserve list or saying, we won't do this again or whatnot, they doubled down. Less than a year later, they came up with another reprint set. The same thing with the number two behind it. And collectors fled the game, as you'd imagine. To this day, Yu-Gi-Oh! is not a game that you invest in. Not if you want your investment to hold. People talk about the value of their decks going down. That isn't just because of bannings or whatnot, although that is part of it, of course. Same thing in Magic, though. It's also because they reprint the heck out of cards that get enough popularity. It may take them a while, it may take them a year to do so, but they do, and then your investment is not worth as much. Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game that is more about players than collectors, and I think that's true of Magic as well, but if you think of this spectrum of wholly about players to wholly about collectors, I'm assuming wholly about people that are only players versus wholly about people that are only collectors. The hypotheticals for the sake of this argument. Yu-Gi-Oh! is more on the only player side of the spectrum. But, but, that isn't strictly the best thing to do. Magic the Gathering has actually found, or it's been trying to find, a bit of a middle way. And I think that that's a good thing, personally, even though I definitely don't consider myself to be a collector. It's nice to have a game that collectors can go to. Obviously, you don't go to Yu-Gi-Oh! Magic is the next biggest game that does this. If you want to increase the supply of cards, in other words, increase accessibility, how do you do it in a way that doesn't hurt collectors? And I don't know if it's actually possible to please everyone, but they're trying their hardest, and one way that they do that is create new versions of the card that themselves can be more desirable to collectors. Judge promos, expeditions, just any sort of promo card are the first ones to come to mind. You can get a Misty Rainforest, or you can get a, an Expedition Misty Rainforest, or you can get the Modern Masters 3 one with the, the ugly border. I, I'm not a fan. That's just my opinion. But you can get any of these. It'll slightly, the, the Expeditions and Modern Masters 3 will slightly increase the supply, but especially in the case of the Expedition, they're qualitatively different. Not mechanically, of course, but they create something that the original did not have. And that's appealing to collectors. Let's say, back before Eternal Masters, you could get Caracas from Legends, or you could get Judge Promo Caracas. It slightly increased the supply, but the collectors could go towards the shinier one, the more valuable one. That's one way to do it. 
there's nothing, that doesn't really hurt anyone. It increases the supply so slightly, and it creates a kind of unique product. That doesn't really hurt cards most of the time. Uh, you may remember that for some time, the Judge Promo Imperial Recruiters were worth way more than the, I think, Portal 3 Kingdoms ones because there was just so few Imperial Recruiters of the, the older, the Portal 3 Kingdoms one. You got an increase in supply, and it didn't really hurt the value of the other one. Now, the other way is, if you're going to reprint a card like this, don't reprint it in standard. Reprint it in a limited run, or supplemental product, but a limited run. There are two different schools of thought on this. If you print it in something like Conspiracy, Conspiracy is not a super limited print run. If you put Exploration in there, a lot of people are going to get Exploration. And so, if that's a card that collectors are really valuing, they might get mad at you for that. It won't be as bad as if it were printed in Standard, where it's a card that would be bought much more, because Standard in general sells more. But it won't be... They won't be as happy as if you do it in a more limited run, like a Modern Masters set. If you see a card getting reprinted, and I just checked this today, you know, right before I recorded this, uh, the Misty Rainforest, you know, I, I own Zendikar Misty Rainforest, and they did not drop the drop in price that much. Not in paper. Online, yeah. It was, it was a deal. But on paper, just a smidgen. Again, as of the time that I checked this, that may have changed since. A lot of the reason for that is because, you know, you aren't expecting so much of a greater supply that it dips the price too much. That's one way to get in. It doesn't really hurt collectors that much, maybe a bit, and it might even have the opposite effect. More demand for the format means you might sell the card a little bit more. Just something to consider, I suppose. Especially if increased supply of a given card makes a deck that uses them more prevalent, they have more chances to win now. If they win, they're more, there's more demand for cards in that deck and then the value of your cards just went up. I very much like when Wizards of the Coast prints a set like Modern Masters. And this is why. I, even though I have a lot of these cards myself, or had them, I appreciate that it makes the format more accessible to people. Modern isn't quite my favorite format. Mine is Legacy. And it breaks my heart that there's a reserve list it's going to keep a lot of people from being able to ever afford, without using proxies in a casual group or whatnot, to be able to afford to get into what I think is the most or the second most skill-intensive format in the game. Modern doesn't have that issue. I like it when they cater to newer players or players who don't have all of these cards by making them a little bit more accessible. But I also appreciate that they want to keep collectors happy. Not unhappy, whatever the case may be. This middle way, I doubt makes everyone happy. But personally, I think it's a good thing for the game. I think it's healthy, and I don't think that there's much use in complaining. If you're a player, you have more cards. If you have a collector, yeah, there are more cards out there, and that might slightly decrease the price for now, or it may increase it in the longer run. And also, you get another printing of a card that might itself be qualitatively different, enough to be another collector's item. Like with Expeditions, like with Masterpieces, like with whatever comes out in Amonkhet that mimics that. It's a good compromise, and I think Wizards of the Coast has found that. For whatever it's worth. Alright, that's it, Magic Community. Take care, and I will see you later. Bye-bye.